Well, here we are in Exodus chapter 26 and 27. It's our second and third chapter here in considering the construction of the tabernacle. Uh, as we're going straight through the Bible, and right now we're in the, the book of Exodus, we are coming up to this place where we find the details given of this Old Testament tabernacle. I know many of us, if we were to write Scripture ourselves, and thankful we didn't, we would give a summation here about the, the tabernacle. But the Lord goes through, as I mentioned in our introductory time in this passage a couple weeks ago, that the Lord gives seven chapters of detail about the, the construction of the tab tabernacle, the furniture within it, the high priestly garments. And then if that were not enough, after a couple of chapter pause, he gives an additional six chapter, it actually is, of, of the same details now in the construction of it. And all of it is because if we, as we look down in our Bibles now at Exodus chapter 20, 26, where we begin tonight, let's glance just back up at the final verse of chapter 25, something we saw several times in 25, and we'll see more in the chapters coming. And we're just reminded of this, and this is why the Lord gives the detail. And, I, and so there in Exodus 25, verse 40, it says, and the Lord says, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which is shown you on the mountain. So the Lord gave instruction in detail and he said, make sure you make it just like I'm telling you to make it. And why is that? Well, because it all points forward to Christ. As the book of Hebrews says, he is the true tabernacle, which God erected and not men. And so the, the tabernacle and its furnishings and the whole worship service there was pointing forward to Christ. And so, so much of him that we can learn and his dwelling place from a study of the tabernacle. And so today we consider the tabernacle proper and not the furnishings within it, but the actual boards and cloths of the tabernacle itself. The tabernacle means tent, or could also mean dwelling place. And we know in John 1.14 that Jesus came and he dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and there the Greek word in the New Testament is he tabernacled among us. God would say elsewhere in Scripture, I will be your God, and you will be my people, and I will dwell among you. And so as we consider now the boards and the cloths and the coverings of the tabernacle, we consider God's dwelling place, a place where the Lord dwells, where he would meet. And if you were to take a bird's eye view and look down on the tabernacle in the, those desert years and the 40 years in the desert, we would find the tabernacle in the middle, and then the, the, all the tribes some tribes to the north, some to the east and the west, and some to the south. And as we number those tribes, we'd realize that it would take the form of a cross, a bird's eye view. And right there in the center of that cross with the, tab the different tribes gathered on various sides, uh, right there in the heart of it is the tabernacle, or God, uh, a picture of God dwelling with his people. Well, let's, ju let's jump into our text, Exodus chapter 26. Verse 1, moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim. You shall weave them. So here in the first verse, we find that there would be ten curtains, and this was a fine linen, okay? It also had blue, purple, scarlet thread, uh, and some artistic designs of cherubim in that, all right? There will actually be four coverings across the tabernacle. This is the first of the four. This is the most beautiful of the four. It's fine linen, blue, purple, scarlet thread, angels woven, cherubim woven into the inside, something you'd want to look at, something that would be in... Um, uh, like an art gallery, just something so beautiful. And that's, that's important for us to, to keep that in mind. And then in verse 2, it tells us the length of each curtain was 28 cubits. Remember, a cubit, 18 inches, kind of the, the point from the, the, the finger to the elbow. Uh, so 18 inches. So th these would be 42 feet. Um, and then they were uh, the width was 4 cubits or 6 feet wide. So each of these curtains, 28 
feet by, or 42 feet by 6 feet, okay? And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Make, sure, make them all the same. Verse 3, five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. So they'd be sewn uh, five and five. And then in verse five, and you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain on the selvage of the one set, and likewise you shall do on the outer edge of the other set or the second set. Uh, so these two groupings of five curtains each, each of them 42 by six feet, are going to be j uh, joined together uh, in the middle uh, with 50 loops. Verse 5, 50 loops you shall make in one curtain, 50 loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is on the other end of the second set, that the loops may be clasped to one another. So they'd be joined together, but they'd still be separate, okay? And uh, then verse 6, And you shall make fifty clasps of gold, and couple the curtains together with the clasps, that it may be one tabernacle. So what we find is that this one tabernacle, uh, th these curtains are, are going to be laid over and attached. Uh, then as soon as we get into verse 7, we're going to read of... Curtains made, notice, you shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. Uh, notice, you'll make 11 curtains of this kind, so, so one more curtain. Uh, the length of these curtains, verse 8, shall be 30 cubits, so that is 45 feet or 3 feet bigger than the first curtains. And the width of each curtain, 4 cubits. And uh, eleven, and then eleven curtains shall have all the same measurements. And then, really, we're kind of following the same thought pattern here. Verse nine: You shall couple five together, and then six together. Verse ten: You shall make fifty loops. You should join them both together. Uh, verse eleven: You shall make fifty bronze clasps. Not, now, these are not gold clasps, but now bronze clasps. And and you you should. Uh, join all of those together. Uh, and then verse 12 talks about the, the remnant because the second grouping of curtains is just a little bit bigger than the first grouping of curtains. It says, verse 12, the remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, that the half of the curtain that remains shall hang over the back of the tabernacle because it was bigger, it would cover the entire back. And then verse 13, and a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side, because remember these are 30 cubits rather than the 28 cubits of the, the very beautiful uh, fine linen uh, curtains. These, these uh, are darker curtains and they, have, they completely eclipse the others. Uh, and it says, and what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. And uh, if you still have breath, uh, check out verse 14 with me. And it says, And you shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. Okay, now we're up to verse 14. And what we have found here are four sets of coverings. And I have a picture here if you're wondering what's going on here with all of this. Um, this is... This box or square or the, the rectangular tabernacle would have been covered uh, with four layers. And, and as they're all joined together, you can see the, the long, narrow strips, like right up here at the front, these long, narrow strips that would be six feet by 42 feet of the beautiful fine linen initially, blue, purple, scarlet thread. They'd be joined together together five and then coupled in the middle and then five all the way back and they're going to loop all the way over the tabernacle then on top of that you're going to have your goat skin and the, i don't love the white color of that goat skin because most commentaries would say that second covering of of the goat skin would have been dark it would have been rough it would have actually been kind of a black almost a felt feel to it and then you have the uh the ram skins dyed red, probably all of the wool pull, pulled off of those ram skins and then tanned and, and it would look like a beautiful leather. And then on top of that, the badger skins, which would have, uh, or some other sort of otter sea animal, would have had a waterproof uh, subst or, uh, feel to it. And so it would have kept the whole thing dry. But those four layers that are shown there would not have been laid that way. Every one of them covered. In fact, that second covering or the most unpleasant to look at would have covered the whole thing. 
So you would say, why would you have this beautiful first covering and then just completely cover it over with goat skin and then ram skins and then, and then badger skins and you don't even see any of it. Well, here's a couple of things that we had realized. From the outside, the tabernacle would have looked very plain. But once you were inside the tabernacle, it would have been marvelous. That's when you would have seen the glory of it. And so this tabernacle was the place where God's people would meet with the Lord. First in the outer court and then the holy place and then ultimately into the most holy place. And then we'd also consider putting four of these coverings over it. There's no outer light that's getting into this, right? The only light in the tabernacle is the light that comes from the lamp and the oil within the lamp. And we'll, we'll talk about that later tonight. Or, and the kind of glory of the Lord as he would have had his presence in there. And so then all of these, the blue, purple, scarlet thread with the artistic weavings of the cherubim would have reflected an amazing glory. And so you have all of these, but we could say, you know, you have five curtains sewn together, but then joined in the middle with these 50 clasps joining to other, another five curtains. Why not just sew all 10 of them together? And why, why sew them together? And we could consider this verse that we read over, but I want to point back to it. It's in verse 6. And it says, And you shall make 50 clasps of gold and, and couple the curtain together with the clasps. And not, no, notice at the end of verse 6, so that it may be one tabernacle. And so what we had find with the various pieces sewn together, that it was many that came together as one, and then with the five and the five, there was a diversity, but still a unity. And as I think about the body of Christ, that the Lord has, like, remember even when Jesus prayed that we, in John 17, 21, he said, Father, I pray that they would be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And you think about these these different curtains, the Jews, the Gentiles, but all of these individuals that come together to make this, these, all these curtains that came together to make one tabernacle where the Lord would dwell. And you know what? That's the truth of the body of Christ today is that he gathers all of us together as the church. And then what does he do? He dwells in our midst. And it's when we have unity in him and we see him but also the diversity of our own gifts that we see Christ. We see Christ reflected in one another. And the Lord desires to dwell right in our midst. Check out a couple of verses from Ephesians 2. and Ephesians 2, 19, I'll, I'll read to you here. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the true cornerstone. Here the imagery of a temple, not necessarily a tabernacle, but still the dwelling place. But notice verse 21 of Ephesians 2, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And then verse uh, 22 of Ephesians 2 uh, says, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. I like that. How we, like cu curtains coupled together, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And where's the glory? It's on the inside. It's not the outside. Where was the glory of that tabernacle? It was where the Lord was on the inside. That's why we don't try to impress each other on the outside. We don't want to be whitewashed tombs. It's not the clothes we wear or how tough we look. It's, it's the Christ on the inside. It's Christ in me that bears witness with Christ in you. And think about even when Jesus came to earth, there was no beauty that we should desire him. On the outside, he wasn't appealing to man on the outside. He wasn't like those Pharisees who went around in their long robes on the outside. No, but, but Christ, uh, 
glorious, uh, the Son of God, and, and it was his inner holiness, compassion, care, the truth of who he was. And so, so we consider this tabernacle overlaid with all of these, these different pieces here and uh, these different garments. And we pick back up and let's make some progress in our text here now in verse 15. And it says, in the tabernacle you shall make, and for the tabernacle, excuse me, in verse 15, you shall make uh, the boards of acacia wood. So we move from the cloths to the actual wood, okay, standing upright. Uh, now these, 10 cubits shall be the length of the board. So again, 10 cubits, do the math, 18 inches, right? 15 feet. So it's believed that these, the tabernacle was 15 feet tall. And that would make sense. Um, if it's 15 feet tall on one side and uh, 15 feet tall down the other, that that 40-foot stretch of cloth would, would come over both, both sides. And, um, and, and so then you have... Uh, these 10 boards, 10 on either sides, uh, verse 16, uh, 10 cubits shall be the length of a board and a cubit and a half its width. So that's two feet and three inches, a little more uh, challenging on the math there for some. And then, uh, and then verse 17, and it says, two tenons shall uh, be in each board for binding one to another. Thus you shall make all the boards of the tabernacle. Uh, and verse 18, and you shall make the boards of the tab, uh, and you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side, and you shall make 40 sockets of silver for it. And, and so uh, there would be a, a 20 boards on the south, 20 boards on the north side, uh, and then two sockets of silver each. Um, and then verse 20, and, and on the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, you shall also have 20 boards. So there are 20 boards of 10 cubits each, each, uh, each, each, verse 21. And there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each board, and that would be to secure it like a tent stake. Uh, for the, uh, the side of the tabernacle, uh, westward, you shall make six boards. So that, that's the back of it would have six boards and then also two additional boards, verse 23, at the corners to, to add uh, structure. So eight boards totaling uh, uh, total along the back. Uh, there was just one door into the tabernacle at the front. Verse 24, uh, they shall be coupled together at the bottom and they shall be coupled together at the top. Uh, thus, it shall be for both of them. And they shall be for two corners, uh, so there shall be eight boards, and there are sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under each of the boards. And, and so uh, then there's some cross pieces, verse 26, and you shall make bars of acacia wood, uh, five for the boards on the side of the tabernacle, five for the boards on the other side, and the five uh, bars uh, for the boards... Uh, of the side of the tabernacle for the far west side, uh, the middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards uh, from end to end, and you shall overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold as holders for the bars and overlay the bars with gold, and you shall raise up the tabernacle. Notice, notice verse 30. You shall raise up the tabernacle according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So, of course, before the, the tabernacle was overlaid, it was fitted together. And here specifically, we have the, the measurements. Some have wanted if there were still slats in, in the, the tabernacle uh, for, uh, for to, to see um, or if it, was just, if it was just all of wood. But it would seem like there would still be slats, of course, so that you could see the artistic designs of the cherubim from the inside and, and the glory. But the, the thing I notice about the tabernacle and the boards is in verse 30 is that, I like this, you shall raise up the tabernacle according to the pattern which is shown you. And I like that. Raise it up. Raise it up. Just as I taught you. This is what? The dwelling place of God. And build it up just as I taught you. And today, we have instruction in the New Testament how we are to raise up or build up the dwelling place of God, the church. To edify, you know, the, the word edify 
takes in the Greek New Testament takes its word from from a construction word of building a house. And we have instruction in the New Testament on how we are to build up the body. Ephesians 4.29 actually begins with one way not to do it. And that says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but then rather, but what is good for necessary edification, that's the building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. It would be later on in the next chapter that Paul would say, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And just as there was an Old Testament configuration of boards and sticks and how the the tabernacle was to be built up, so the Lord gives us instruction today on how the church is to be built up. Sometimes pastors miss the mark here. I think any pastor can complain about the body of Christ. And I oftentimes hear pastors do this sort of thing. They want to talk about how Christianity is missing the mark today and how poorly we're all doing. It's like the sheep come out for another bee eating every week, you know. And it's like the scripture tells us how people are built up. We speak to one, to one another in words, a psalm, hymn, spiritual song. And the church is edified through this, not through complaint, now, certainly, that, that means we also are to exhort one another daily while it's called today. But there is a big difference between a godly, gentle, yet firm exhortation on the godliness and just a bl- in blanket statements about how pitiful the present-day church is. And, you know, I, my, my belief has always been that when the body of Christ individually, when we speak to one another, And we speak words of grace, not words of complaint, but let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, knowing how you ought to answer each one. That's a marvelous thing that takes place within the dwelling place of God, that the church is built up through edifying speech, not corrupt speech, but through edifying speech. And then we also know that the church is built up by us using our gifts, verses that we actually looked at at church uh, on Sunday as well and at our Calvary camp. It's a a theme that the Lord won't let us uh, get away from at at this time here at Calvary Bozeman. But Ephesians 2, 13 uh, through through 15 there, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Ephesians 4, 16, I'm sorry. Ephesians 4, 16 uh, here that we uh, saw, again, it's from whom the whole body joined and knit together I think about the boards of the tabernacle joined and knit and the sidebars going through the whole body joined and knit together by which every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love or the building up of itself in love. And so as we all use our varying gifts, as we all speaking to one another, uh, the dwelling place of God is built up. I tell you what happens when we serve one another and when we speak to one another about Christ. Christ is seen among us. And when we complain about man, whether it's ourselves or some other outside influence, is God in our thoughts? Are we, like, are we enriched by that? We're not. But when we, when we point one another to Christ, that this tabernacle is built up, and I believe God is dwelling within our midst. What a blessing it is to go away from a conversation thinking about God, thinking about the Lord, thinking about his faithfulness. And so we, we continue on now in verse 31 of our text in Exodus 26. And it says, And you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple and scarlet thread and a fine woven linen. What is this veil? Oh, this is the infamous veil. (laughs) This is the veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. So the tabernacle itself was uh, 15 feet wide and it was um, uh, and it was 30 feet long and and so what you have here is uh, this small area that was the uh, the Holy of Holies, and then more of a rectangular area, the, just the holy place. And here we're reading of a veil that was in between them. And, and so the veil woven with artistic design of cherubim. And verse 32, and you shall hang on it uh, 
or hang it upon, hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, and their hooks shall be gold, and upon the four and, and upon four sockets of silver, and you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil, and the veil shall be a divider. Dum dum dum. The divider. <laughs> The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy place. And then notice one more verse here, and then we'll pause and give a little commentary. And you shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. Okay? So what we find here is the, the tabernacle proper has a holy place and a most holy place and a veil dividing, that, that a separation veil, okay? And then behind the veil, the only piece of furniture in the holy of holies is the ark of the tabernacle. And we studied this in detail when we went through chapter 25. Uh, we know that this, this, this ark, uh, the ark of the covenant, uh, inside had the Ten Commandments. So it would uh, later contain some of uh, Aaron's, or Aaron's rod that budded the, the, and the manna. But on top of it was the mercy seat in between two cherubim. And God said, that's where I will meet with you. We also know that the high priest was only allowed into this place and him only once a year. So only one man and only once a year on the day of atonement or Yom Kippur. And he would make atonement for the blood of the people. And, uh, and on top of it, the mercy seat. We talked about how Christ... Uh, it fulfills that and how he met with us and, and, and paid for our sin by his blood there at the mercy seat uh, where he rose again from the grave and he satisfies that work. But here this, this veil has separated the old and the new. And I think of Isaiah 59 too, and it's the same Hebrew word here for like this divider. And Isaiah 59 too declares uh, your sins, your iniquities, have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You like you might want to, Romans uh, you know, 8.37, it like, well, but I thought nothing could ever separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. No, nothing will ever separate you from the love of God, but your sin will separate you from God. And so just like that veil of separation, between the holy and the most holy. That, that reminds us of our sin. Our sin separating us from being in the most holy place with the Lord. This veil was truly, I mean, although we know much, we think much about it, we think about how on the night Christ was crucified, this veil torn in two from top to bottom. But if we were just to put ourselves in the Jews' day and realize that this is the most holy place, and of course there's a veil there, because no man can see God and live. He's holy. And when we put it in that perspective, and we consider this veil, and then consider the removal of that veil through Christ, and then each one of us so freely invited into the presence of God, we again have a, a maybe a fresh thankfulness to the Lord and, and for his grace and what he, is, what he has done for us. So it's not only, but I also like Ephesians 2, 13 through 15, for it's not only the, the one sinner that passes through that veil, but I like how uh, Ephesians 2, 13 says this, but now Christ Jesus, but in Christ Jesus, you who are once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And here he's talking about even a middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile or how all people have come near. Ephesians 2.14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Or that, that was the enmity between Jew and Gentile. And because in verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two. So if this tabernacle is a picture of the dwelling place of God, one awesome thing is that all peoples, Jew, Gentile, are invited in to this place. I also love Hebrews 6, which tells us that the forerunner has entered 
behind the veil for us. And there, there it's like an anchor, Jesus, an anchor for our souls behind the veil, sure and steadfast. And so we have access to the most holies because of what Christ is. Uh, just interesting as you as you read there of the the initial uh, laying of that veil between the two that divider, uh, verse thirty four. Then uh, you shall uh, put the mercy seat on. Then verse thirty five. We'd read that. And then verse thirty five of our text uh, says, "And you shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the south side." The um, and the table would be on the north. So these two pieces that we had read before, of the lampstand and the table for showbread, they'd be in the most holy place. The priest would go into that part every day, only the most holy place once a year. And, and so the, uh, uh, the, the lampstand was on the south, table on the north there, the, the arrangement given to us. And then verse 36, And you shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle. So now a screen, not a veil, but a screen for the tabernacle woven of blue purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver and you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold their hooks uh, shall be gold and shall be cast and shall cast five sockets of bronze for them so only one door into the tabernacle uh, of course, only one way in uh, to the Lord's presence, and that is through Christ. He is the door. Then in chapter 27, a shorter chapter, but, but we look at three pieces of furniture here. Not necessarily furniture, but we have the, the burnt offering, the, the tabernacle itself. And uh, then we finish with the lampstand. But let's look at these three quickly. Um, and first is when you walk into uh, the courtyard area, and we'll talk about the courtyard in verse 9. So you have the tabernacle, but the tabernacle was then placed inside a larger courtyard area. The very first thing walking into the courtyard area that you'd see was the altar of burnt offering. And, and we read of that here in verse 1 of ch chapter 27. And you shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. Uh, so seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet um, by uh, four and a half feet. And, uh, and you shall make its horns on its four corners. Uh, the, the, uh, on the Day of Atonement, those four horns would be covered with blood. And, uh, and you shall overlay it with bronze, not gold, but bronze was the metal of judgment. So picture people coming in. The very first thing they see is judgment. They see the sin offering being offered. And verse 3, And also you shall make its pans to receive its ashes and its shovels, its basins, its forks, its fire pans and, you, and its utensils of bronze. Uh, you shall make a great fort, a network of bronze, and on the network you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners, and you shall put under the rim of the altar beneath in the network, uh, that the network may be midway up the altar, uh, and, and so that the spot where uh, the, the animal would be sacrificed in the verse 6, and you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. Uh, the poles shall be put in the rings, and the poles shall be put in the two sides on the altar to bear it. So like the other pieces of the furniture, the, the bronze altar, heavy, would be carried by men. The Levites would divide out and carry these things. And you shall make it hollow with boards as it was shown you on the mountain, so they shall make it. Again, just according to that pattern. But one thing we notice is that as the tabernacle went from place to place to place, what went from place to place to place? Judgment. And like everywhere they went, judgment, judgment. They're always reminded of this. Um, every, there was the sin offering burning continually, but the, only in the high, holy of place, holy of all, once a year. And it was just a constant reminder of judgment that was there in, in that time. And we... And so we are to not take lightly the death and resurrection of our Lord. And Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this often thinking of me. And we remember that the Lord was our sin, our sacrifice for us. And, and that's why we pass 
through judgment and into his presence. And we have a fellowship with him through, through his blood. Verse 9, uh, then you shall make the court of the tabernacle. Uh, for the south side there shall be hangings for the court uh, made of fine woven linen, uh, 100 cubits long for one side. So the, the court of the tabernacle was 150 feet. Uh, and then on the other side, verse 10, uh, and it's, uh, you'll have 20 pillars and 20 sockets of bronze. And then likewise, verse 11, along the length of the north side shall be hangings um, of, of the 20 pillars um, with its 20 pillars and their 20 sockets of bronze and the hooks of the pillars and their bands of silver. And then verse 12, and along the width of the court of the west side uh, shall be hangings of 50 cubits. So it would be 75 feet along that side. So 150 feet by 75 feet with their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets. And then verse 13, the, the width of the court on the east, east side shall be 50 cubits. The hangings on one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. Verse 15, and on the other side shall be hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. Then verse 16, uh, for the gate of the court there shall be a screen 20 cubits long woven of blue purple and scarlet thread and a fine woven linen made by a weaver and it, and it shall have four pillars and four sockets and all the pillars around the court shall have bands of silver and their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of bronze the length of the court shall be 100 cubits uh, width 50 throughout and the height five cubits uh, or seven and a half feet uh, made of fine woven linen and its sockets of bronze and all the utensils of the tabernacle for its service, all its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. And so, uh, verse 16, I had me it had mentioned the 20 cubits long on either side. This was the opening. And so, if the opening was, um, it, it had, uh, it, was, it was 75 feet across, and so it was 30 feet, and then 30 feet with a 15-foot wide opening. Again, just one door into the whole uh, uh, outer court area. Now, the, the outer court area just presents us with this thing that we've that we're mindful of. In the day when the tabernacle was erected, there was differing levels of worship. All the people go, could go at times; they would not fit at once. But they could go into the tabernacle area. They could go into the outer court area. But then only the Levites and the priests could go in to the holy place, and then only the high priest in the most holy place. Later on, when Solomon would build his temple, there were actually four outer courts. There was the, outer, there was the, there was the priestly court, then the court for men, then there was a court for women, and then there was the outer court of the Gentiles. Like, they couldn't even get, get near. And so, like, all of these varying levels, like, how close can you get to the Lord? And, and what we know in the gospel is that there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. And, and you know, it's just this common conception. We come into church and we just inherently think that somebody else can get closer to the Lord than I can, or somebody else is closer to the Lord. Maybe their hands are raised in worship, or, or maybe you just see them living what you assume to be a godly lifestyle, and there can be something along the lines where you feel like, like, I just, I, like I just don't measure, measure up. And, and you know, I, I was actually meeting with a young man the other day about my son Isaac's age, and he's just sharing some things that he's going through and actually sh confessing some sin to me. And I took out a piece of paper and I drew two stick figures on it. And I said, I said, here's Isaac and here's you. And I said, why don't you just draw a line above your head of how much sin you have. And sure enough, he went almost straight to the top of the paper. And I said, now how much sin do you think Isaac has? And sure enough, he gave Isaac some sin. He didn't think Isaac was sinless. But it was about half the level of his. And I just said, I, I'm like, that couldn't be any further from the truth. I'm like, Isaac's a really sinful kid. <laughs> no. 
It's just our common misconception about one another. Like, I'm in the outer court, you're in the inner court. Oh, he's in the inner circle with Jesus. What brings us close to Christ? It's a simple question, and it has a simple answer. What brings us close to God? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So is it my righteousness or my works? No. And so if it's the blood of Jesus that draws you close, and it's the blood of Jesus that draws me close, do we not have the same means to be close and intimate with the Lord? We don't live in a time of courts and separations and the high priest comes in and then the priest and then, no, Jesus is our high priest and he's taken all of us and he's brought us in. So dare not think that the person next to you is more freely invited into the Lord's presence than you are. They may through faith be appropriating that and may have a closer walk but it's not a close walk that you can't have. And if you're missing it, it's just simple faith and the promises of God. You're approaching him by faith that will access that closeness and nearness. And so then the last thing we read here today in verse 20 is that, and you shall commend the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually and in the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil which is before the testimony Aaron and his son shall attend it from evening until morning before the Lord and it shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel I like how the these two chapters that we've gone through ends because it ends in light and again how are the 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 artistic design is going to be seen, the light. And how is this light shining? Through pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause light to burn continually inside the tabernacle. It was beautiful on the inside and the light illuminated it and the light and the lamp came from pure olive oil. Well, we know that the light that we long to have is light on the inside. Jesus said, the, light, the lamp of a man's body is his eye. Kind of like the, your outlook on life. And he's talking about the soul, really. And he says, and if your eye is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. And, and if your whole body is full of darkness, how great is that darkness? When we're lost on the inside, there's nothing worse than that. But on the inside of the tabernacle, there was light. It was the light of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah, 57, or Isaiah 59, 9. Um, we looked for light, but there was darkness for brightness. But we walk in blackness. This was a time when the children of Israel separated because they're saying they're just wanting light. And you know, the light that comes into our life is the light of the Holy Spirit. And the, and the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to do what? reflect Jesus, show us Jesus. So inside the tabernacle, there was the oil that lit the lamp. And the lamp would reveal the presence of the Lord in that place. And so the Holy Spirit is given to us in our heart to, to illuminate Christ to us, to point us to Christ, that we might have fellowship with him, that we might have fellowship with one another. And uh, I, John 1 7. If we walk, or 1 John 1 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another in the dwelling place of God, fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if there's darkness in the inner place today, I just, I just pray that you know that it's not the Lord's desire that you walk in darkness or are in darkness, but that you have the light of life. And that, you're, and that comes from being close to him and in his presence. It doesn't come from some sort of outer sheen or putting on an outer show, but it just simply means coming to him humbly as a sinner in need of a savior 
and recognizing that Jesus died to bring you right into that holy of holies, right where the Shekinah glory comes, that you can be filled with light as, as, he, as he shows you his presence. And you know what? In the body of Christ, when we fellowship with one another, that's, that's where Christ is seen, and he's right here in our midst. We are the dwelling place of God. And so let's, uh, let's continue to spark, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and, and let's just see the Lord edif- glorified among us as we're edified and built up as his dwelling place. Father, thank you so much for your word tonight. Lord, I pray that as we depart from here, we would depart thankful uh, that you're dwelling in our midst, that we'd look for you and one another, that we would encourage one another in you, that we'd speak to one another about you, uh, that there would be none here with condemnation keeping them from coming into the most holy and intimate place with you. We know that what you did for us, Jesus, at Calvary, when you died and rose again, gives us free and full assurance that you'll always love us and accept us, forgive us. And Lord, we pray that light would shine into the dark place. Lord, if there's any with a load of sin, and feel like there's a line of sin stretching from from their head to the heavens, Lord, uh, that you would... Right now, kindly and by your spirit, remind that sinner of your mercy. Remind us of your grace, that we might be forgiven and free and know that there's no barrier, uh, that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, and that we can enjoy the light of your presence. So rush back in, Lord. Shine your light in. We confess our sin. We ask for your your mercy, your grace, and your forgiveness, and come in and make us more like you, Lord, that we would walk closely with you again. And Lord, be glorified among us as the church is built up as a dwelling place of you. uh, Lord, be glorified among us, we pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this night. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.